No matter what crop or landscape one cultivates, encountering aphid colonies is a likely prospect. Sometimes, they are incidental and relatively harmless, while other times prevalent and possibly even damaging or invasive, causing hundreds of millions of dollars in crop quality and yield losses and vectoring the vast majority of insect-borne plant viruses. In order to better manage the problematic species and appreciate those that mostly contribute to the environment as abundant prey, a solid reference for aphids and their unique abilities, symbioses, microbiome, and evolution is paramount. Aphids are classified into the group Aphidoidea, which consists of the extinct lineages we only know from fossils and an extant lineage of those 5,000 or so species we interact with, the family of true aphids, aphididae. The family aphididae was first classified in 1802 by Pierre-André Latriel, just one year after he was described by esteemed colleagues Johann Christian Fabricius as Entomologorum nostri avi princeps, the foremost entomologist of our time and Jean-Victor Adwin as Entomologiae Princeps, the Prince of Entomology. This classification brought together many aphid species identified earlier, such as the cabbage aphid Brevicorinae brassicae in 1791, and several other aphids documented, albeit taxonomically poorly, as early as the 1500s, like the Pistachia horn gall aphid, Bizongia pistachiae, depicted in woodcuts from the 1570s, approximately 453 years ago, almost half a millennium in the past. Assuredly though, aphids have a much longer history. True aphids are most closely related to so-called pine aphids, the adelgids, and the phylloxerans, most famous for devastating many old European vineyards, both of which collectively existed approximately 280 million years ago in the Permian period and are known as the aphidomorpha, aphid-formed insects. Aphidomorphs themselves diverge from a common ancestor with their closest relatives, the coxomorpha or scale insects, an estimated 312 million years ago in the dank, swampy fens of the Carboniferous period. The true aphids, however, specifically originate later, around 220 million years ago or so, in the centrally arid and coast-forested supercontinent of Pangaea during the Triassic period. Much changed in that time. Like their scale insect kin, the basal true aphids in the subfamily Ariosomatini, or woolly aphids like Prochyphilus, produced copious waxen fibers and tended to live sedentary lives sometimes underground or near roots, much like the basal scale insects such as the aptly named ground pearls. Perhaps their last common ancestor had a similar affinity for waxen armor, subterranean litterscape, and root, trunk, or possibly even fungal tissue for nourishment, as some early scale and the closest related order of insects, thrips, fed on fungi. Aphids developed on cone-producing plants similar to conifers called Italis, among others in the Cycadophyta, like Juvia, and the closely related Ginkgos, that used to be more diverse and widespread. And woolly aphids carry on this tradition incessantly, while diverging groups became less waxy and moderately more active and nimble in comparison. By the mid-Jurassic period, about 230 million years ago, and early in the evolutionary line of wasps, Parasitoids that colonize and kill their hosts developed around the same time wasps got their thin waist. One of the most specialized aphid enemy groups developed and diversified quickly during what has historically been called the Mid-Mesozoic Parasitoid Revolution, which begot groups like Aphidiini and Aphelinidae, among other aphid-oriented groups of wasps several of which have been verified to be excellent biocontrol agents for aphids in modern times. During the parched, torrid, early Cretaceous period, approximately 125 million years ago, cycad-type plants were in decline, though the first flowering plants are estimated to have developed then and on which aphids adapted mechanisms they brought to bear and survived 
at least three major extinction events, which is an impressive pedigree for survivability. As descendants from the larger lineage, the order Hemitera, aphids have a piercing mouth part like their distantly diverging relatives, the leafhoppers, treehoppers, cicada, seed bugs, stink bugs, and plant bugs, which save for predatory or omnivorous species, usually pierce plant tissue to imbibe their sugary juices, either from fruit, phloem sap channels, or sometimes the xylem water channels. In fact, the closest insect order to Hemitera is the Thysanotera, the thrips, which retain mouth cone parts that scrape surface tissue and drink the liberated cell contents, representing a transitionary stage of adaptation from the most primitive mouthpart type, chewing, to a liquid adapted piercing mouthpart. Of course, if it weren't for the ancestor of Hemitera obtaining essential symbionts, specialization on plant fluids would not have been tenable. Hemitera means half wing and refers to most adults in this group having a pair of full sized wings and a set of smaller half wings. And this includes the aphids, which can be helpful in identification, at least when such adults are produced, as they have mastered a versatile lifestyle that gives them several adaptive advantages to consider. Aphids are unique among insects in having certain life cycle stages or phenotypes that develop over multiple generations, as a wingless female asexual life stage can produce offspring that will instead reproduce sexually or develop wings to colonize new hosts, or deposit eggs for overwintering. Wing development is usually triggered by external stimuli, like environmental or plant physiological cues specific to the species, such as day length and temperature, which induce hormonal and other changes in the mother that determine the form in both progeny maternally and grand maternally, a developmental pipeline referred to as telescoping generations. Since the typical live birthed aphids are born pregnant with the next two generations already developing, this transgenerational influence is one of the key ways aphid colonies quickly adapt to their circumstances and break aphid resistance in crop and uncultivated plants, or develop resistance to natural or synthetic chemicals used to control their populations by growers. To summarize an interesting but complex development, aphids tend to develop winged forms under unfavorable conditions, and wingless forms under favorable conditions, and females can convey information to live birthed offspring in the form of biological signals about the surrounding environment prenatally, optimizing their developmental success. Since there are over 5,000 species of aphids, which is 30 times the number of their aphidomorph relatives, it is speculated that this unique capability is a large factor in their global success. Aphids asexually reproduce by a special kind of reproduction called the Lydicus parthenogenesis, whereby unfertilized females produce more females and do not need to mate with males which may be produced at another time, such as during autumn when the environment chills, or less commonly during warm springtime, such as with the soldier gall aphid, Nippon aphis monzenai. Though about 3% of aphid species are totally asexual and have no male recorded, such as the shallot aphid, Mysis ascalonicus, and brown citrus aphid, Toxotera citricitis. Females have two X chromosomes, whereas males only have a single X, as they lose the second X during development in a process referred to as the XO sex determination system. Recent genomic analyses show that the aphid X chromosome is highly conserved and unchanged, while other chromosomes have extensive rearrangements compared to other hemitera, and across aphid species, chromosome numbers vary greatly with a significant portion in representative species comprised of transposable elements, genetic sequences that tend to move around in the genome and change the expression of certain traits and can help aphids overcome plant defenses especially. The full range of aphid chromosome number has been documented between 4 to 72, with one genus, Amphorophora, representing this range as 
Amphoophora sensoriata, which contains 72 chromosomes. Aphids rely on an array of senses to detect, locate, and establish unsuitable hosts, including visual, olfactory, tactile, and gustatory cues. Different species are attracted to certain volatile compounds they sense with their antennae while their compound eyes resolve images in very low resolution compared to human sight. Aphids tend to be sensitive to certain wavelengths of light we would interpret as green and blue, as well as ultraviolet. Like many other insects, they also have primitive eyes called ocelli, which interpret less detail than the compound eyes, but are important for detecting polarized light associated with sunlight coming from the sky, which helps them keep stability and bearing during flight. With their tiny stout bodies, aphids are clumsy, inelegant flyers that can make their way to plants several dozen meters nearby to colonize, but rely on being swept up in the jet stream air currents for long distance travel of over a thousand kilometers in some cases. With the right stimuli, an aphid attempts to descend and alight with a targeted surface and test its suitability as a host. For many aphids, the establishment success rate can be exceedingly low, but prodigious reproduction and proximity to hosts makes up for this, especially in environments that are less fragmented, like the undeveloped lands before human urbanization. While most aphids feed on foliar tissue like the leaves, stem, or even flower and fruit, several species develop primarily or totally on roots, making observation more difficult though container cultivation may allow for root inspection in some plants. Aphids feed on plant phloem, or sap, which is a liquid medium through which plants transport dissolved solutes like minerals, amino acids, nutrients, and primarily photosynthate, or sugars produced from photosynthesis, to various parts of the plant and can be thought of as analogous to an animal circulatory system in this way. Sucrose is the most common plant photosynthate and stimulates aphid feeding behavior. The ancestral insect mouthparts are for chewing solids and were not specialized for a purely liquid diet, but an extremely influential event happened that contributed to these robust mandibles, transforming into intricate probes. In order to feed on such an unbalanced diet with proportionally few nutrients compared to sugars, the ancestors of aphids and their relatives across the Hemiptera required microbes that synthesize essential amino acids, among other dietary services, and this catalyst made it possible. Aphids use their piercing mouthpart called a stylet to penetrate the plant surface with delicate precision. Moving between or sometimes individually piercing the cylindrical mesophyll plant cells which contain chloroplasts that perform photosynthesis, or a small taste test of the apoplast, a continuous vein shared between cells where dissolved nutrients are transported. When drinking from cells to gauge suitability, aphids inject special compounds and proteins called effectors that suppress cellular immune functions before reaching the larger phloem sieve elements on which they will engorge themselves. Since the pressure difference between the aphid's body and the phloem is so massive, sap will readily flow into them like a living tap, shunting under positive pressure through the mouth part with no need for suction. Plants have evolved various defenses against this special siphoning system, such as callose deposits, that are produced to block sap flow and deny aphids easy feeding. But so too has the aphid physiology adapted by secreting both a gelling saliva that anchors the insect and coats the mouth part, as well as a less viscous saliva that partially predigests the sugars and neutralizes both the immune signaling between plant cells and toxins which might otherwise more severely damage the aphid's body or interfere with the sequestration of nutrients. A single aphid can have a strong and immediate local immune suppression effect, but as a colony rapidly grows, this effect stacks and radiates outward with alacrity. Host plants to which an aphid species has adapted may be much less effective at countering their physiological advantages, while less suitable plant hosts may severely curtail feeding, development, and reproduction with defenses to which the aphid's physiology is less compatible. As parasites, aphids can stress their host, sometimes severely, 
though some populations can achieve numbers in the hundreds without killing or causing overt signs of disrupting the host. Feeding results in the production of digested sugary waste called honeydew, which is an important and highly nutritious resource to which several organisms are attracted. In a few cases, it has been documented that the sugar that aphids tax from their hosts provides a sort of mutualist benefit through protection by recruiting guards, like ants, that may protect the aphid and plant from more destructive herbivores to secure the energy-dense resource. Additionally, fungi known as sooty molds from the group Capnodiales utilize honeydew as a substrate on which to develop. While they are not plant pathogens, the presence of sooty molds can foul flowers or other important produce, causing cosmetic damage and their opaque colonies reduces photosynthetic activity in the leaf tissues directly below them. Microbes, as well as metabolites, can also be passed through honeydew, influencing the surface microbiome of plants and the physiology of insects like ants that consume it. For example, some ant species like the invasive Lazius niger were found to have lactobacillus known to break down sugars in their gut due to their attendance of aphid honeydew while the Japanese mugwort aphid Macrosiphoniella yomagicola manipulates its ant guards to be more aggressive with the inclusion of dopamine in their aphid honeydew. A physical structure unique to the aphids useful for identification are the cornicles or siphunculi, a pair of hollow tubes or pores that produce defensive secretions like alarm compounds and many species e beta farnesine that elicit evasive or avoidant behavior in nearby clonal individuals, and unsaturated triglycerides that can lethally or sublethally impact the ability for a predator to feed or continue to forage by adhering to mouthparts, eyes, antennae, or limbs, and hardening into a cumbersome encrustment. Some aphids seem to be able to tailor the composition of these secretions based on attacker detected. Since E beta farnesine is so common among plants, it is possible that early aphids co opted this sesquiterpene as a signal compound before they could produce it in their own bodies, as some researchers speculate. Many aphids also incorporate compounds from plants that may be toxic to enemies, such as iridoid glycosides, in the case of the stink vine aphid, Acerthosiphon hyponicus or the toxic glucosinolates like sinigrin in mustard plants, which are concentrated in the bodies of the cabbage aphid Brevicorni brassicae. In combination, these two general defenses available to most aphids help ensure that the collective clonal colony can disperse from a threat at the sacrifice of a smaller proportion. Many insects produce a cutinous wax substance that coats their body and keeps them water repellent and disrupts the development of certain microbes. Some aphids have developed more pronounced waxy growth on part or all of their body, which repel moisture or sticky honeydew from adhering to their bodies and may affect pathogen or predator attack. In fact, wax coatings are resource intensive to produce, requiring specialized glands and may be a way for excess carbohydrates to be converted into glycerides and saturated hydrocarbons as another way to manage the gargantuan levels of sugars aphids process daily, with such potential additional benefits as avoiding detection by enemies, reducing fungal growth, or freezing potential at low temperatures, and possible microclimate stabilization. Like other social insects such as wasps or termites, and even the gregarious scale insects, Aphid colonies can be thought of as a collective superorganism, where individuals have evolved to have traits that altruistically benefit the group, much like the cells in a multicellular body. And this makes sense when individuals are virtually clonal copies of each other. Despite the sheer selection pressures for aphids to evade the many natural enemies and inclement environments that exist, it appears that host specialization extreme reproductive capability, alarm signaling, defensive adhesive, production of a valuable energy resource in the form of honeydew, and microbial symbioses comprise the general aphid defense arsenal. 
Aphids have acquired a bevy of microbial symbionts that are integral for producing certain amino acids, ammonia metabolism, processing toxins and sugars, and the neutralization of parasitic wasp larvae or fungal pathogens that threaten the host body. A relationship that has evolved several times within the aphid family, bacteria have colonized specialized fat body cells called bacteriocytes. Insects of many lineages have developed similar symbiont housing structures convergently, with aphids and their basal ancestors having a unique context most similar to closely related lineages. To establish, ancestral symbionts had to be capable of bypassing the aphid immune system in the gut generally, and movement into these special cells played a major role in this evasion, while the production of small RNA segments have been shown to regulate aphid gene expression and likely neutralize some antimicrobial immune factors. Aphids rely on primary symbionts like the bacteria Buchner aphidicola for amino acid production, without which aphid ancestors would not have been able to specialize on such an unbalanced diet as sap. So important is this bacterial species that it is reliably transferred to progeny in most cases, while secondary symbionts called heritable facultative symbionts can be acquired through plant-mediated transmission between aphids and exist at different levels between species and their subpopulations. Secondary symbiont bacteria like Regiella insecticola and Hamiltonella defensa permeate various other tissues and neutralize aphid parasites while bacteria like Serratia symbiotica attenuates heat stress. But these mutualists can have costs to individual aphid longevity or certain host plant suitability. For example, the protective effect of Hamiltonella defensa only occurs in strains colonized by their own symbiont, a symbiont of symbionts, or hypersymbiont, called Acerthosiphum pisum secondary endosymbiont, or APSE. APSE is a type of virus called a bacteriophage. While bacteriophages usually kill or harm bacteria as a natural course of infection, in the case of Defensa, it confers toxins that can destroy developing parasitoid wasps, which are a common parasite of aphids in nature and also as biocontrolled by growers. Fascinatingly, the Hamiltonella Defensa found in aphids derives from a pathogenic ancestor and is a stark reminder that an individual body is its own ecosystem, and symbioses can change radically over time given the right conditions. Another radical example is the symbiont Rickettsiella viridis, which increases the production of blue-green polycyclic quinones in P. aphids, giving them their green coloration, which lowers predation detection by lady beetles compared to their base red color, but increases their parasitation by aphidious wasps in experiments. Secondary symbionts like those found in the representative P. aphid are often described with names like P. aphid secondary symbiont, P. aphid U-type symbiont, and some bacterial genera found in other representative aphid species include Spiroplasma, Rickettsia, Sodalis, Wolbachia, and Arsenophonus. These endosymbionts tend to evolve radically smaller genomes than their free-living ancestors due to their aphid environment obviating the importance of many former traits, facilitating themselves through hosts despite losing those genes. Ultimately, this causes an increased dependence on the host as well as other established symbionts, which may provide complementary services to each other as well. In this way, the aphid microbiome is an extended genome, a retinue of adaptive genetic augmentations. Although many insects rely on symbiotic microbes, and may even have received genes into their own genome through the process of horizontal gene transfer, aphids have such transferred genes for producing bacterial cell wall materials such as peptidoglycan, and this can help them closely regulate symbiont development inside their specialized cells, as this capability has withered over time in the bacteria. Symbiont communities can be disrupted as some are lost, shift in dominance, or even replaced. 
And so some genes gained from past transfers are from events that happened millions of years ancestrally, supplementing the capabilities of successive generations. Uniquely, some aphids in the tribe Serrata aphidini lack the common Buchnera symbiont and instead harbor a yeast-like symbiont thought to be in the group Hyrenomycetes. Many insects have bacteriocytes or similar structures to shelter symbionts, and most of these essential symbionts tend to be proteobacteria. Coincidentally, the mitochondria are responsible for important cell metabolism in animal and fungal cells are thought to derive from an ancestral alpha proteobacteria, so there is already great precedent for utility and intimate bacterial association. Plant pathogens can also establish mutualistic relationships with aphids, and none are more common nor harrowing as plant viruses. Aphids are infamously recognized as the most prolific plant virus transmission vectors, with some estimates assigning around 75% of all vectored plant viruses to be through aphids. And this is primarily because their finely honed mouthparts can imbibe plant cell contents without violating their structural integrity, allowing viral particles pass through saliva to immediately bypass several layers of physical and immunological defenses, and start unchallenged both within plant cells and throughout phloem elements that reach throughout the plant body. Aphid saliva depresses the local immune system response, which can facilitate virus replication that likewise imperils the plant's immune system as it replicates. The cumulative damage benefits both parties by making resource acquisition easier to an extent, though some viruses are totally asymptomatic in some hosts while crippling others which can be beneficial for those plants that might host the aphid as the aphid may represent a mutualistic ally that can challenge or wipe out nearby competitors that may make colonization of the immediate area easier. Aphids don't even need to find a suitable host to inoculate a virus, as the quick act of probing for nutritional cues can be all that is necessary, much to the chagrin of cultivators globally. Some aphids have unique relationships with certain viruses that might entail behavioral changes like repellents to already infected plants brought about from plant-produced volatiles and surface cues. Of these 5,000 or so aphid species documented, only approximately 1% are polyphagous and feed on many different plant species while approximately 99% are monophagous or oligophagous and so feed on one or a few related species respectively. Although a few select species with massive host ranges have become insidious pests, there is generally a close relationship between an aphid species and its host plant, meaning that when cultivating a crop, an aphid that feeds on a non-crop plant species, like a weed or banker plant, is not necessarily a threat to the crop population and vice versa. In fact, some growers take advantage of this and allow non-pest aphids to establish to encourage the generalist insect and mite predators, as well as parasitoid wasps that will feed on them, and in many cases, the pest aphids that might also show up in the crop. A popular example of this is intentionally cultivating barley, oats, or wheat colonized with bird cherry oat aphid, Ropalosiphum patty, as the prey on which commercial or naturally occurring parasitoid wasps can establish like aphidious irvi. If set into a cage, where the aphids cannot escape, but the smaller wasps can, the grass aphid rearing system acts as a perpetual banker crop that doesn't risk different biocontrols depleting the population uncontrollably, and can even be refreshed with more aphids if the population requires it. Natural enemy field reservoirs, like these, can be highly effective under the right context. 90% or so of aphid species are anholocyclic and do not host alternate, but about 10% are holocyclic and switch between a usually closely related group of primary and secondary plant host species or groups that are typically very unrelated. Investigation 
into the evolutionary development and ecology of aphids attributes this diversity of plant hosts and aphid species to the acquisition and subsequent loss of this host alternating lifestyle, partly influenced by host extinctions or developmental isolation from primary hosts. Over enough time, aphid species and their geographic subpopulations may develop traits or acquire microbial symbionts like viruses or bacteria, and insect symbionts like certain groups of ants that help them colonize new host plant species. Usually, plants that are related to the current hosts are more likely to have similar traits to them, which could be exploited by the biological repertoire an aphid already has at its disposal. But convergent evolution between some unrelated plant species that adapt to similar environments or other selection pressures can develop similar traits that happen to be just as or more easily exploitable. Knowing this, a cultivator might consider the potential for species adaptation to their crop or nearby plants, which may provide a safe haven for them to perennially return from, or that a pest species might develop new capabilities across the earth, which are then transported eventually to their area, as has been documented in certain species. Even cultivar-specific populations can become adapted. Several aphid species formerly considered to have wide host ranges have been reclassified as host specialized biotypes. Perhaps the most famous example of this is a model aphid often used in research, the P. aphid, Asterthrosiphum pisum, a species that actually comprises a complex of genetically distinct but visually identical groups that feed on different species of legumes. Similarly, many species in the genus Eurolucon subsist on various asters or composite flowering plants like sunflower or hawksbeard. In both cases, an ancestral lineage diversified and specialized across genetically related plants in the same family that were in geographically close and similar areas. Because aphids rely heavily on asexual reproduction, Mutualisms can occur in some populations and through clonal propagation erupt across an area over a short time span, especially as agricultural movement disperses these fortified lineages unknowingly. Resistances to chemical and microbial agents as well as insect biocontrols have been associated with this tendency for agricultural systems to expose aphid populations to localized pressures like chemical pesticides or biological agents that select for potent adaptations that are subsequently distributed globally. This is one reason preventative biosecurity is so crucial at the property, provincial, and even national or international level. It can be difficult or impossible to know when or where such a development will start or reach and the damage it might entail as typical management strategies become less effective without warning. In contrast, the extremely polyphagous cotton melon aphid, Aphis gossypii, is already associated with approximately 900 plant species across 116 plant families, including more than 100 crop species that are important. Cotton melon aphid host range includes families like mallow, pomegranate, buckthorn, coffee, and citrus. At first, research seemed to indicate that there are various cotton melon aphid biotypes or strain lineages across Earth that host switch and those that do not, making the group as a whole more diverse and so more adaptable to management strategy. In actuality, there is no single cotton melon aphid that growers interact with. Rather, there was an ancestral plant host, some species of buckthorn, that the last common ancestor of these populations developed on as a primary host, from which several discrete groups developed as host-associated populations on other plants. Since the primary host is both the main source of nutrition, shelter, and other microenvironmental influences, and the site of sexual reproduction, 
it will have major selective influences on the physiology and subsequent descendants for adaptation, which can be as rapid as a few growing seasons. This can biologically isolate the populations in addition to being physically removed from the old primary host. Different lineages become specialized and utilize different plants as primary or secondary hosts, resulting in identical groups with genetically different predispositions, which can diverge from grower expectations and experiences. Primary hosts can even be the site of hybridization between aphid species and subpopulations that share it for sexual reproduction, as has been documented many times. Closely related species in the genus Aphis, like the soybean aphid, cottonmelon aphid, and buckthorn aphid, have been documented to mate together with viable offspring on buckthorn, and this has been confirmed through the identification of shared haplotypes, or sets of genes inherited together on the same chromosome, which can only really happen this way. Because this level of insight is only possible by observing aphid physiology at the genetic and molecular level, it is imperative that such discoveries and their implications for growers are shared in a timely and accessible format, an impetus for this very video. Ironically, despite having the common name cotton melon aphid and a scientific name of Gossypii relating to the cotton's genus Gossypium, the ancestral primary host is well supported to be Ramnus or buckthorn plants. This is another example where the longtime common or even scientific names of insects based on diet or early observations under easily visible but narrow agricultural contexts can be misleading, or at least belie a more comprehensive appreciation for their tendencies and capabilities. Knowing a more complete set of alternate or preferred hosts allows growers to adequately threat model their integrated pest management strategy for those pests by removing or otherwise preparing against them if suitable hosts of concern are nearby. Similarly, such a propensity for adaptation complicates breeding crop plants for pest resistance as mutations and the potential hybridization of different lineages can produce physiologically robust offspring with the acquisition of new or improved plant defense or environmental resistance traits and microbial symbionts. Breeding programs aimed at aphid resistance that do not account for such changes may not be substantial, durable across seasons, or even provably resistant to the actual diversity of the target pest, and so growers could benefit from an assiduous approach to verifying breeding standards of purportedly resistant cultivars before acquisition or implementation. Evidence is always preferable to hype, even if it comes from a familiar source. Some aphids require special strategies due to specific capabilities or host plant or cultivation contexts, but there are several management techniques applicable to a wide range of species that share similar vulnerabilities. An integrated pest management strategy starts with knowing the relevant aphids to the target plants, including their appearance, life cycle, potentially vectored pathogens, and seasonal activity. Since aphids are ultimately an external threat, disrupting their ability to make contact with the plants with screen, netting, or a more impermeable barrier like an enclosure severely reduces the chance of establishment where practicable. Because aphids so easily move through cuttings, newly acquired plants should be quarantined ideally and inspected or treated preventatively. Although resistance to certain natural and synthetic chemistries has been documented across different populations, aphids and other insects tend to share a susceptibility to botanical compounds like azadiractin or pyrethrin, especially at concentrations sold commercially that can be applied to foliage or roots in many cases. Horticultural oils can also be employed to the foliage for some plants, but both options are somewhat indiscriminate to their effects. Predatory insects and mites used as biocontrols of aphids and other pests are likely to be affected by oils and insect affecting compounds as well, which is why a knockdown application is often applied first 
before following up with biocontrol agents like Chrysopra green lacewing or Cirphidae hoverfly larvae, which are active in foliage as well as the aphid mid Aphidolides aphidomyza, which produce larvae that directly feed on dozens of aphid pest species. Parasitoid wasps are commonly deployed in high numbers to hunt and parasitize aphids, developing inside them and eventually turning them into husks called mummies. But certain species may have a narrow selection of aphids that they manage, while others have a broader host range, and this should be verified if unsure. In some places, the existence of hyperparasitoid wasps that parasitize the parasitic wasps used in biocontrol can impair their efficacy, but it can be challenging to assess their presence in the field and quantify their effect. Finally, certain fungal parasites will infect various aphid species broadly, like Buvaria bassiana or Isaria fumosaurosea, and unlike insect biocontrols, they can penetrate the substrate and disrupt soil-borne root aphids. Banker crops, like other agri-environmental spaces, grown to attract and support aphid natural enemies can add an additional protective layer to preventative plans, especially in crops exposed to the environment, though they will require maintenance like irrigation and crop scouting. Plants with many small flowers and bright colors like white and yellow, are known to attract parasitoid wasps as a site for nectar resources that dramatically increase longevity and performance, alternative aphid prey for local establishment, and congregations for mating, such as in the case of sweet alyssum, Lobularia maritima. Research on the subject of aphid bankrupt systems has found that Aphids are constantly being introduced to new areas, mainly through agricultural pathways or by wind. Some estimates have aphid dispersal at a few hundred meters, while some have been documented at 1300 or 1600 kilometers. Large-scale sites of plant cultivation are important vector points, from which aphids diffuse into natural fields and residential areas, so growers within several kilometers of cultivated pest aphid hosts could have a higher chance of encountering them and should avail themselves of specialist information about local aphid activity where possible. Aphid populations can build up especially at warmer temperatures and if relevant host plants are known to be active in them, particularly in the case of agriculture. There are numerous first report examples in the past few decades of newly documented species intercepted or establishing in new areas, so changes in population range across seasons are also likely.